Hi everyone, welcome back to Enviro Geeks. This week I'm joined by the amazing Rachel. Hello. And we're going to talk about a couple different things. Alrighty guys, so this week we're going to talk about water conservation as well as food waste. Hey guys, it's Editing Emily. I'm going to hop in here real quick to make a little uh, amendment to what you just heard me say. Um, So when I was first planning this episode, I did not think we had enough to get a full episode out of just one of these topics. So we put them together to give you guys a good length, and the opposite happened. (laughs) Um, It ended up being much longer than I had anticipated. So to keep it at a good length, I am going to cut this into two parts. So the first part will be all about water conservation, And then the second part will be all about food waste. So I apologize about that. I'm still figuring out and learning things as I release more episodes. But it can only get better from here. And I hope you enjoy this episode about water conservation. And I hope you join us again next week for our episode on food waste. But that is it for now. I'm going to send you back into the episode. I hope you enjoy. So we're going to start with water conservation. And as a reminder, last week we talked about how limited a resource water is. Less than 1% of the water on Earth is available for use. Does that mean just not salt water? Um, so salt water makes up 97%, and the remaining fresh water is frozen. Oh, okay. We also talked about water pollution last week and the importance of, importance of keeping our water clean. Another important aspect of our waters is conserving water. Before we talk about what we can do to conserve water... We first need to talk about why it is important to conserve. And for that, we need to look towards our friends in the West and the South. Probably the most well-known example of the impact of our water consumption is the Great Salt Lake drying up. Hi, Zach. Thanks for recommending that. Current estimates are that the Great Salt Lake will be completely dry in five years. Now, I've never set out to have this podcast be focused on the doom and gloom of environmental science, but quite frankly, we're running out of time to prevent the lake from drying up. So why exactly is the lake drying up? Well, this is happening because of two reasons. First being climate change, and the second being excessive water use. Now, I know what all of you guys are probably thinking. Water use? But it's salt water. Well, I'm not talking about pulling water from the lake itself to use, but rather the water diversion from rivers that feed the lake in order to support the growing population in agriculture. So does that mean, like, damming up water and diverting it to different, like, towns? Is that what that means, or...? Um, It's more pulling water straight from the river to use so that there's not enough in the river to feed the salt lake. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, there's not enough water heading downstream to get to the lake. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Because as we know, the water cycle happens, water will evaporate, and then it's generally replaced by 
the river flowing in, but instead not enough is coming through. So it's the responsibility of the people upstream to conserve their water usage so the lake doesn't dry up. Very much so, yeah. Okay. So one of the problems with the lake drying up, specifically with the salt lake, as the water in the lake dries up, the salinity, or how salty the water is, will also increase. This means long before the lake dries up, the salinity will increase to a point where it is no longer inhabitable for organisms. Currently, in some areas of the lake, the lake's salinity is up 17% from where it normally is, and researchers are worried that the lake has already reached a level that is too salty to sustain life. Is there evidence of this? Like, is there evidence of there not being any fish in there or anything like that? Um, so right now they're using, I think it's called brine flies, um, as their marker. So they're going out to collect the eggs in hopes that if water returns to the lake, they can introduce them to the lake. But they're using that because um, they're at the bottom of the food chain. So if they go out, everyone goes out. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So we don't, do we not know about the fish then? Um, I couldn't find anything in the news articles I was reading, but I'm sure I would, I would honestly bet money that the fish population has declined because of this. But there are still fish there just declining most likely. Mm -hmm. And this happens because as the water evaporates, um, the salt doesn't go with it. It is too heavy. So, as the water evaporates, the salt stays in the water, so the concentration goes up. Because there's less water, but more salt. Right. So, once all the water evaporates, we'll be left with a big old salt block. Mm -hmm. So, the lake drying up isn't just an ecological concern, but also a health and economic concern. Salt Lake City will likely see a decrease in tourism because of this as well as the collapse of the brine shrimp fishing industry that's there, and the loss of mineral harvesting from the lake. If this wasn't enough reason to conserve water and help the Great Salt Lake refill, there's also a huge health ramification if it dries up. The problem being air pollution. How does air pollution play into this? So when a lake bed dries up, it often leads to a dust storm. And dust storms alone can cause many issues, mainly problems with the respiratory tract. But dust storms from the Great Salt Lake drying up would be even more dangerous. This is partially because Salt Lake City already has some of the dirtiest air in the country currently. However, mainly because the dust storm would also carry heavy metal pollutants from the lake's dried up bed with it. And heavy metal pollution can cause a host of medical issues, but the main one is neurological damage. With all this being said, the Great Salt Lake drying up is just one of the examples of how our overconsumption of water is impacting the environment. There are countless other examples of lakes across the West and the South that are facing similar issues, like Medina Lake in Texas, which normally refills every year. It'll dry up in the winter months, but it'll generally refill. But again, because of the water use and overconsumption, it has not refilled this year. So that's another issue of people upriver using too much water. Mm-hmm. And most of that um, honestly comes from agriculture. They use 70% of our water worldwide. 70% of that 1%. Mm -hmm. So most of our water use goes to agriculture. And basically what that means is we as humans try to grow things where they should not grow. Where they don't want to grow. So we have to use a lot of water to make them grow there. As well as water for, you know, livestock. That's going to be a hard argument to sell, though, telling farmers to move. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. But there's ways, um, there's certain irrigations that they can use to minimize the water that they're using. So there are solutions other than just telling grow people you can't crop. grow these crops. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There are different solutions, um, which we need to definitely look into and um, try to implement. A lot of the issues we talk about, even if there's stuff that we can do at home, which is what our po- what this podcast is mainly about, um, one of the biggest ways to fix a lot of these issues is getting regulations put in place. Because without them, you're essentially relying on the goodwill of everyone out there to make a change right. that they may not want to make. Now, regulations is a scary word. Like, what do those kind of regulations look like? So is that, like, for the farmers to use certain practices, or what does that mean? Yeah. Does that impact people at home? Um, Generally not. Generally, when you're talking regulations, it's directed towards companies um, or farmers. But it can kind of fall into two different categories. The first being where... If they don't do something, they get penalized. And the second being, if they do something, they get rewarded, yeah. essentially. You get incentives. Stick. Yeah. So, if we think about human nature, <laughs> generally the most effective regulations come from the incentives rather than the penalties. Hmm. But that's, um, I mean, there's a whole degree you can get in policy making for environmental issues. So I I just know some. Yeah. <laughs> Not a whole lot to be honest. <laughs> Cuz that's I I focused on the biology side rather than the policy side. Right. So I still had to learn the major policies, but I didn't learn how to put them into place you learned <laughs> or the write cool them. You stuff, not the paperwork stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> So, what are some ways we can conserve water? So, this is going to be kind of a a long list. (laughs) Not going to lie. But the first thing you could do is look for water sense products, which, if you've heard of Energy Star products, they are Energy Star products, they're products that use less energy to do the same thing. Mm hmm. Um, so when you see an energy set star product or a water sense product, it's backed by the EPA to do those things. So water sense is like energy star. It just uses, um, water more efficiently. So it'll use less water to do the same job. The second thing we can do is fix household leaks. Um, Household leaks can waste 10,000 plus gallons of water per household every year. And this adds up to about a trillion gallons of water nationwide. Jeez. So one of the things you can do is participate in Fix a Leak Week by the EPA, which is March 20th through the 26th this year. And I will post the link to their... Um, web page about that in case anyone is interested in looking into that and participating. Another thing you can do is plug up the sink or use a wash basin if washing dishes by hand rather than having the water run continuously. However, if you have a dishwasher, it is better to use a dishwasher than rather than wash by hand. Oh, I did not know that. I would have guessed the opposite. I would have too, honestly, but um, it actually uses less water to run the dishwasher than wash it by hand. I suppose it is, like, specifically built to utilize water appropriately, probably, rather right. than me splish-splashing. Right, exactly. And if you think about it, nowadays most people wash dishes by just turning on the faucet and letting it go. And letting it go, wash let it, it go, rinse. let it go. Yeah. yeah, so it's running the whole time that you're washing. You can also scrape your plate instead of rinsing it before loading it into the dishwasher. So another thing you can do is add food waste, your food waste, to your compost pile instead of using the garbage disposal. 
Also turning off the tap while shaving or brushing your teeth. Showers actually use less water than baths, as long as you are keeping an eye on how long you've been showering. So when you can, use a shower instead of a bath. Which I feel like now is... We still use that as one of our way to con- one of our ways to conserve water, but realistically now, I think most people take showers; they don't take baths. Yeah, that's probably true. So, and if you're taking a bath, it's normally like every once in a while to relax. You know, you're not generally doing that every day. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I would say the more important thing would be to make sure you're keeping an eye on how long you're taking a shower. You know, okay. don't hop in the shower and stay in there for an hour. Okay. <laughs> Keep the crying under hot water to a minimum. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> After those long, long days, you gotta hurry it up. I'm sorry. Think of the earth. <laughs> Think of the earth. I know you've had a rough one, but you gotta speed it up. <laughs> the earth's having a harder time. <laughs> When it comes to laundry, one of the things you can do is wash only full loads of laundry or use the appropriate water level or load size selection on the washing machine. If only I knew. (laughs) It's always large for me. I can never guess. It's always large for me because I take too long to do laundry. (laughs) That too. It's like, well... (laughs) Uh, also, to save, speaking of laundry machines, to save money on your energy bills, set your washing machine to use cold water rather than hot or warm water. This is because you won't then have to use electricity to heat up the water. Also, I don't think I mentioned this with the dishwasher, but when you are using your dishwasher you should do the same thing only run it when you have a full load just to maximize its washing um capacity yeah (laughs) something like that yeah (laughs) another thing you can do in the bathroom is install a dual flush or low flow toilet or put a conversion kit on your existing toilet. They have conversion kits for that? Mm-hmm. Interesting. Are those complicated? You know, I don't know. I've never... I've always rented, so I've never, um, you know, done anything to <laughs> Never done to anything the to the toilets. toilets. <laughs> That's not my business. <laughs> so, I truly don't know. But I would imagine... If they're selling them to the general public, it can't be can't be too super difficult. complicated. Yeah, one would hope. Yeah. If you own your own home, you can install a gray water recycler. What the heck is that? So, there's when you're looking at wastewater, there's three different types of wastewater. Your first is clear water, which is what comes out of your sinks. The second is gray water which is water that can be recycled and used again, like water from your showers, um, your kitchen sinks, or sinks in general. The third is black water, and that mainly comes from your toilet, so it can't be used again because it's contaminated water. Yeah, okay. So gray water recyclers <laughs> take the water, take the get the gray water, filter it, and then use it um, again for like your shower or whatever else. Interesting. Mm-hmm. And so homeowners can install that. Mm-hmm. You can also install a rain barrel for outdoor watering. Rain barrels are just what you attach to like your uh, spouts, downspouts, and stuff, right? Yep. Exactly. And you can use pretty much anything. Like, I saw a TikTok the other day where they used a trash can. Hmm. They took the lid and, like, flipped it upside down so the dome part was in the trash can. And then they cut out a hole. And then they put 
they ended up putting a screen over it because little critters kept trying to get in the water. Yeah. Um, and then they attached, like, a spout to the end, to the bottom, and attached that to PVC piping, drilled holes in the PVC piping so that they could just turn it on and it would water their plants. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, you're really hanging cool. out on the cool side of TikTok. <laughs> I don't get that kind of cool stuff. <laughs> It was really cool. I was like, I want to do that. (laughs) (laughs) Another thing you can do is create a water smart landscape. So a couple episodes ago, we talked about rain gardens. That would be an example of one. But um, with those, the best thing you can do is plant native plants. Because they are adapted to grow in your environment. So realistically or I should say ideally they shouldn't need any extra watering if you're going through a drought or anything like that you may have to give them some help but for the most part they should be adapted Mm -hmm. to live in the area yeah exactly for the landscaping does that also include like not having giant cement pads and stuff like that or what other kind of landscaping um besides just the rain garden so basically, <laughs> there's a, a bunch of different types of um, landscaping you can do to reduce the amount of water you need to use. A lot of it focuses on native plants. I'm going to be just perfectly frank with you guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I. I'm so native to think plants of, are the way to go. Yeah, for sure. There's, like, um, landscaping where you can install drip irrigation, which is one of those types of irrigations where it um, uses less water to water them, water the plants. So rather than you watering all at once, it just constantly drips. Hmm. Um, And that uses less water. mm Mm-hmm. I would not have guessed that. (laughs) Well, you're also putting the drips in a specific place. Versus when you're watering, generally you're spraying, like, the whole area. Yeah. You're not really focusing on just the plant and its roots. So, that helps. There's, um, a different, another type of landscaping. It's called, I want to call it zero-scaping? Exerscaping? I'm not really sure how to pronounce it, to be honest. (laughs) (laughs) It's X-E-R-I-S-C-A-P-E. But it's a different type of landscaping that reduces your need for water. It's essentially designing it. It's a specific way to design, which requires little or no irrigation or other maintenance. It's mainly used in arid regions. This sounds like stuff for homesteaders, things like that. (laughs) It can be. Sounds a little advanced for me. (laughs) (laughs) It can be. To be honest, I'm just starting to get into different types of landscaping. Um, Because I always knew, like, um, we talked about this on the rain garden episode too, but I always knew that, like, grass was not good you know (laughs) and that native plants were good like that's as far as my landscaping went because um when I was studying and even before then I was mainly focused on more the animal side Mm -hmm. as you know who I am (laughs) right um Versus the plant side. So I'm just starting to dip my toes into the plant side of things. uh, Which is pretty common in the conservation field. Like you have, you kind of divide into two. You're either super interested in the plants or you're super interested in the animals and you want to save all the, you know, cute, adorable animals. Right. (laughs) I always was drawn to the more animal side of things. So I'm starting to learn plants a little more. Mm. So I don't have a great answer for what other types of landscape there are but my plan is to do more research on that are there there. uh, resources for people who want to plant native plants like 
how do you know what's a native plant? I wouldn't even know where to begin. Yeah. Um, so you can obviously Google it and you should come up with some answers. Google will know. Google, <laughs> Google will know knows what's everything. Native to me. <laughs> <laughs> it knows where I'm at. Um, but the best thing you can do is talk <clears throat> to there's native nursery native plant nurseries. And the best okay. pla- the best thing you can do is talk to them because they'll have knowledge on what specifically is native to your um, area. Okay. So that, again, is a quick Google search and those locations should come up. Sounds like that's the way to go because from my limited understanding, it seems like they would be pretty easy to keep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They're like, um, when they're getting established, they may need some extra help just because they're trying to get established. But once they're established, they're, you got to weed, but you got to weed with every garden and then you pretty much just let them go. Yeah. So, and we, we talked about it some in the, um, not to just repeat, but (laughs) we talked about it some in the rain garden and also benefits your, um, local eco ecosystem Mm -hmm. because you're providing habitat essentially so you get kind of like a mini national park in your backyard that's cool something to brag about yeah exactly (laughs) (laughs) exactly so another thing um to get us get back on back on track (laughs) (laughs) sorry no you're fine (laughs) I could talk about native plants all day. I don't know a lot, but I am a huge advocate for them. So I could spend all day talking about native plants. People are going to get a double dose of it today. (laughs) But another thing you could do um, specifically outside to help conserve water is to sweep your driveways, sidewalks, and steps rather than using a hose to hose them off. You can also wash your car with water from a bucket rather than using a hose. This is the same concept of like washing dishes or turning off the sink while you're brushing your teeth. So you've essentially got more of a limited amount of water to work with rather than just letting the hose run and run. Mm -hmm. With that being said, um, the better thing to do is actually use a commercial car wash because really? they recycle their water. I did not know that. Mm-hmm. Oh man, my dad's going to hate hearing that. He loves washing his car. <laughs> it's I, like his pride and joy. I'm not going to lie. When I was typing this out, I was like, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Rachel's dad is not going to be happy. <laughs> no, that's bad news. <laughs> <laughs> you guys don't know my dad but he loves washing his car <laughs> he he truly does <laughs> he really really does <laughs> another thing you can do is if you have a pool use a cover use a cover which will reduce evaporation when the pool is not being used And finally, the last thing you can do is reduce food waste. Because as I said, agriculture uses the most water. So if we are reducing our food waste, meaning we're buying less, essentially, then in theory it should trickle down and also cause them to use less water then. So if everybody in mass reduced their food waste, it would help a lot. Mm-hmm. And we're going to talk about the other benefits of reducing your food waste, but for sure. So I know we have a lot of friends and family who live in an area where water conservation is like not a big deal. We, you know, mm-hmm. you don't ever have to worry about water running out of the tap. Right, we have the opposite normally, right. the excess of water. So why should people who live in those kind of areas where water scarcity is not an issue, why should these people care or do any of these things that we've talked about? Yeah, so um, mainly because all of our waterways are connected. So every area is in a watershed, 
And what that means is the river, the area, the watershed area is drained to a river and all of its tributaries. So that land, all the water that lands on that land Mm -hmm. drains to a certain area. So for us, we're in Ohio. Um, We definitely don't have to worry about water. We don't really have droughts, even when we say in this area that we're in a drought we're not it's not really really a a drought drought. we just have less water than we normally do um so in ohio there the continental divide goes through ohio as well for water and so what that means is that the top portion of ohio drains into lake erie and then follows the great lakes out to the atlantic ocean but that's only a small portion of Ohio. The rest of Ohio drains into the Ohio River, which drains into the Mississippi, which continues south. So the simple answer is we are upstream. <laughs> we <laughs> are know? those people that are responsible for the lakes drying up or whatever down below. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're part of the reason. You know, and even in the east, I I will be frank, it's not as big of an issue as it is in the west they get significantly less water in the west than they do than we do here in the east um but with that being said the south still struggles with the wish with um water availability so the more we can send their way the better they the better off they are so we may not see the effects of what we do but it does have an impact down the line yeah yeah. And quite frankly, if you live in an area where you pay for your water, um, you know, like some areas in Ohio use wells and you're not necessarily um, paying for your water. But doing these things means that your water bill is going to be lower. Mm-hmm. And even if you use a well as your source of water, you're prolonging the life of that well. By taking less water out of it. Okay. So it's it's kind of a two-part benefit. <laughs> mm-hmm. You're helping people that are downriver from you, but you're also um, helping yourself by doing it. It's just less... It's not as easy for us to see that because we have... So much. So much of it, but it mm-hmm. still is a benefit. Mm-hmm. Definitely. And even in, um, last week we talked about water pollution and rivers have an easier time recovering from pollution because of the water flow, especially if the pollution is degradable, which mm-hmm. means it, it will break down over time. So giving our water systems more water and more water flow means it has a greater chance of recovering from any pollution that may occur. That makes sense. My mom actually was just talking about that, how um, one of the rivers that she used to play in as a kid was super polluted, and you technically weren't allowed to swim in it. But now, because of like water conservation efforts and whatnot, that river has changed, and now it's much less polluted and can actually like be swam in. Yeah, um, so the Clean Water yeah. Act... Uh, was passed in 1972 because of the Cuyahoga River catching on fire. <laughs> That'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and because of that, it's had a lot of good benefits. It needs to be amended to include things that we um, are facing today, like microplastics and pharmaceuticals and stuff like that. Pharmaceuticals? What is that? What do you mean? Um, people flushing their meds down the drain, oh. down the toilet. I did not even think of that. Yeah, wastewater treatment plants can't filter that out, and they can't filter microplastics out, so... Don't do that. Don't don't flush your meds. There are programs for that. Get rid of your meds other ways, people. Yep. (laughs) Those poor fish, man. Yeah, because it has adverse effects on the fish, because they're, you know, you're essentially dosing the water. (laughs) Yeah. I don't know what you people are flushing, but those fish are having either the best time in their lives or the worst time in their lives. Well, they've actually found that, um, oh, I forget what species of fish it is, but what, a certain species of fish has started showing 
um, female characteristics, even if they're males, because of the pharmaceuticals being flushed. Oh, okay. Yeah. I've definitely heard jokes about the water turning the frogs gay. Is that what that... that Probably. Something related? (laughs) (laughs) We don't need to get on that, but I've definitely heard about things like this. But the Clean Water Act did... um, a really great job and our water has improved to the point where uh i want to say it was 2016 or 2017 when the epa tested our waterways 60 percent of them were deemed clean clean enough to swim and fish in mm-hmm. which may not sound like a lot you that know like 60 like percent <laughs> wow <laughs> color me impressed <laughs> but Prior to that, in 1972, when they tested all the water, after the creation of the Clean, Clean, Clean Water Act, it was only at, like, 37%, I want to say. Oh. Don't that is much worse. quote me on that exact number, but I want to say it was 37%. Significantly less, whatever yeah. that number may be. Yeah. So, it's done a great job, and it's done other things, too, but it's done a great job at getting our waters clean. It just needs to be amended. And the other problem is that it has to be enforced constantly for it to be effective. Yeah. So. Alrighty, guys. That's where we're going to end part one of this episode. I hope you enjoyed listening to part one about water conservation. Don't forget to join us back here next week as we finish up our conversation about food waste. If you have not subscribed on YouTube yet, we'd greatly appreciate if you did. If you have not followed us on your preferred podcasting app, I would love it if you did that as well. Don't forget to also follow us on social media. You can find us on all the platforms at Pod. And the links will be down in the description. If you have any questions, comments, or additional information you'd like to share, shoot us an email at envirogeekspod at gmail.com. And until next time, don't forget to check for leaks. And be safe out there, guys. Bye!